Hello, welcome. Good morning, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. going back on mute, thank you. Hi guys, Allie Edwards, I'm in for Audrey today. Good morning. Well, good morning. Thank you guys for joining us today for the training. Um, if you don't mind, we are recording this this um, presentation as well. We will be um, posting this on our Volunteer NC website on YouTube. Um, so we will be sending a link out for that. Um, if you don't mind, when you come in, you basically can put your where you're from um, in the chat. And basically, we'll be monitoring that throughout the time. And also, if you have questions as well, be, be more than mindful to put those in the chat as well. Uh, my name is Kenneth McClellan. I'm actually the volunteer coordinator for Volunteer NC. Um, today we have, with this presentation, we have Mr. Tra Chad Driscoll, make sure I say it correctly, who was a training and technical assistant manager with AmeriCorps Service Commission. Um, and he will be doing the training today regarding Volunteer Reception Center just in time for you guys. So I will be handing the floor over to Mr. Chad. Great, thank you, Kenny. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Chad Driscoll. As he said, I am with ASK or America's Service Commissions. We support the service commissions across the country. They're the entities like Volunteer NC in all the different states uh, and territories across the country. Um, I do have, uh, I'm our, our lead at our organization for disaster um, response efforts. I have a lot of different experience with uh, coordinating um, disaster response efforts training and uh, some deployment experience as well over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, I was with the Iowa Service Commission for 10 years and supporting uh, our AmeriCorps National Service programs as well as uh, some of our disaster response efforts um, before joining um, ASC or ASK today uh, or three years ago. So uh, it, I'm Happy to be here and provide uh, this information. Um, thank you to those of you uh, entering your information in the chat. If you haven't done that yet, we invite you to just put your name and affiliation in the chat. So we have that as a follow-up, but also we can reference it if we need to throughout today. Um, and then also if there are any comments or questions, you can use the chat or you can um, raise your virtual hand and we can uh, pause and you can ask over the audio as well if that's easier. I will note there is a lot of information I'll be covering. Some of the information I will cover in detail um, or in, in more specifics. Some of it I may briefly mention and then move on. This recording as well as the full slide deck will be shared or be available following today. Um, I know too, we're all in the middle of, um, of this work of uh, response, recovery, wherever you're at as an organization, as an individual. And so just want to um, thank you as well for your time and your um, resources and your support for the communities across uh, North Carolina and, you know, the, the East and Southeast uh, as well, as some of you are uh, probably supporting a variety of, of operations as well as your own communities. As we jump in, I do want just to take a moment. Um, like I said, I know there's a lot going on. There's a lot that we're all um, working through. So just to take a moment to kind of center ourselves in uh, focusing and uh, hopefully being able to be present for the next 90 to minutes to two hours here um, on the Zoom call. Um, I'm gonna first just ask us to pause for 30 seconds and just take some deep breaths and focus on where we're at today. So I will start it now. So you just kind of focus on your breathing for a moment, kind of pause. There's a lot of distractions going on. So I want to make sure we're able to focus on, on this work. Great. Thank you. Um, it's a good reminder for myself too, when we get into busy situations to um, take those moments as well. All right. So 
As we start this, this is to talk about volunteer reception centers or VRCs or emergency volunteer centers. They kind of have a variety of names. Today, we'll mention it as VRCs or volunteer reception centers, just to um, use that, that terminology. First, like just to remind, you know, what are disasters? There's a variety of things that happen that create disasters in our in our life, in our in our communities, in our country. Um, obviously, today we're here talking about and focusing on hurricane response disasters um, from Helene um, and others, and the impact that that brought onto your communities. And so, we are going to talk about how we can plan um, and respond effectively to the needs um, of your communities with volunteers. So that's the, the disaster we're with today. Um, there are a variety of phases when it comes to disaster response and recovery. Uh, this is just something you can reference later with your team or teams um, and organizations, um, but I just wanted to leave it in here again. There's a lot in here. There's some things in here I will just kind of skip over, but I want to share for reference. Um, since this is more focused on a just in time training, as you're just getting VRC set up and launched um, today and here in the near future, or planning for it here in the near future. Volunteering has a long history in our country, um, and there's a variety of ways that people volunteer and reasons why they want to why they want to volunteer. Um, they volunteer because they want to help, or maybe they're looking for building up their skills for future careers, or they have a tradition of helping um, um, with their family or their faith community or whatever that looks like. Um, there are a variety of events that trigger uh, those who want to volunteer. One of the big um, uh, events and things that happen are natural disasters or disasters that trigger uh, a huge surge in volunteerism and this this wave of volunteering. So that's what we're experiencing now of a lot of people wanting to provide support and provide their time and their resources. And so people volunteer uh, in a disaster because they do have a sincere wish and, and desire to help people, um, to help communities, to rebuild, to recover. Um, they do it because of maybe faith or religious motivations or other um, entities or causes that want them to to help. They want to have uh, and, and share their experiences as disaster survivors. So some of the volunteers are the survivors themselves from the event and in the, in the community. Um, sometimes people do it for personal benefits. Um, so we want to sometimes be careful of that, of what is that personal motivation of volunteering. Um, people volunteer and there's opportunities through maybe it's court ordered or other community service needs that somebody's filling. But ultimately people volunteer, especially in a time of disaster because they are asked. And so we want to make sure that we're planning and preparing for those who are showing up. And that's going to be our, our focus today. There's a variety of um, terms and uh, terminology that we use in this space. Here are some, but uh, I'm going to make the assumption you're on the call today to learn about this. And so you have a base knowledge of some of this. But again, there, you know, we talk about volunteers, voluntary agencies, voluntary organizations active in disasters, co-ads, as well as our community organizations, the co-ads, our faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, other emergency entities, and state and federal entities that are involved. And so there's a lot that goes into that. Um, I will do my best to uh, share if I'm sharing an acronym or a term um, that maybe we haven't talked about or might not be as familiar, but please... Um, please enter into the chat if you need uh, a, an explanation or definition of something. So when we're in uh, the world of disaster volunteers, there are two main categories of them. There's affiliated volunteers and spontaneous volunteers. Spontaneous volunteers, we also may are sometimes called as convergent or unaffiliated volunteers. Um, and so we'll talk briefly about these two entities and really we'll focus on the spontaneous volunteers as that is the uh, focus of and, and really a need of a volunteer reception center as well. So characteristics of affiliated volunteers, you these are attached to a organization, a recognized voluntary organization or, or VOAD or those agencies that are active in times of disaster, they're 
attach to them. They have some skills that they're coming with, or they've been trained in those. They have um, a management structure that they are uh, follow. They know what to do. They know where to go. They have assignments or they know they will have assignments when they get there. Um, and again, those affiliated volunteers are organized. Um, they've been screened. They've they're covered under their that organizations or agencies policies and procedures, um, things like that. So when we talk about unaffiliated or spontaneous volunteers, it's usually the opposite of that, right? They're not attached to an organization. They're not, we don't know what skills these individuals have. We just know they want to help. So characteristics of spontaneous volunteers, they provide timely help. They are there, they're willing. Um, but again, they're, they're not associated with a specific organization, at least not right away. So we need to know who these people are. They may have disaster training and specific skills, but we don't know that when they show up. They could be an individual showing up. They could be groups of spontaneous volunteers and individuals showing up. They may be from your local community or state, or they may be from out of town. Um, and they also, again, may be the disaster survivors who are able and wanting to come and help at this point in time. So if we have all of these unknowns, um, you know, why would we want to put them in our disaster response? Why, why do we engage in disaster in, in engaging spontaneous volunteers? Well, we do that because there are a lot of benefits of using spontaneous volunteers. So they are a full force multiplier. They bring in that kind of sometimes fresh energy and filling the needs of additional volunteers. They do bring and can bring a broad range of experiences and expertise. Again, we don't know that when they show up, but we learn that throughout the, the volunteer reception center process. Um, they can bring additional resources. They may have access to additional tools or supplies or things like that. Um, and they overall improve our response capacity as a, as a response ongoing. So there are other benefits. Um, I think another thing too is uh, we can track their volunteer hours when they're supporting this disaster response. And so we can count that as our soft match for the state. So you have federal dollars coming into your state and you can offset. There's usually a cost share a state has to pay um, back to the federal government for some of this support. And so that can be cash or it can be in kind and volunteer uh, hours can be tracked and counted as part of that. And, and so volunteers are a huge asset during times of disaster because it helps offset uh, what sometimes you have to pay back um, in these, in these uh, times. So a lot of benefits for using spontaneous volunteers. There are challenges as well. So again, they come in, uh, they have this energy, but they don't maybe have the training or some of the specific skills that you maybe want or need or or need to have. So you do have to figure out how do we get them understanding some of our safety processes, making sure that they have the proper tools. They know how to use these tools. They know the, the procedures. Um, they lack supervision. So we need to make sure we at least have one more of a trained volunteer team lead or somebody we can associate them with um, once they're there so that they can go to someone with questions and we make sure again, they're acting safely when they're responding and, and uh, providing this, this cleanup effort or whatever that may need. Um, challenges are needing some sort of screening process for these individuals to understand who they are. No, um, you know, it does take re planning and coordination of the volunteers. So again, that's what we're going to talk about next is the purpose of a volunteer reception center. And that provides uh, some of the answers to these challenges. If we don't coordinate and support these uh, uh, spontaneous volunteers, it can hinder the current relief work going on by state and federal officials um, and other community organizations. So we want to make sure that we are finding a way to effectively manage uh, these volunteers so it doesn't hinder the work and it doesn't create a negative outcome for the community. So benefits of effective spontaneous volunteer management. Um, so first we talked briefly about what, who are disaster volunteers, 
They're, are they affiliated and un, versus unaffiliated, the challenges and benefits with engaging them. So again, now here are some of the benefits of uh, effective spontaneous volunteer management. Um, by doing it, the main one is it helps prevent that disaster within a disaster. Like I said, if we don't have a way to manage these volunteers effectively or coordinate them and, and arrange them and lead them, uh, it could create to unsafe environments. It could hinder, as I said a moment ago, the current relief efforts going on. So we want to make sure we prevent that by having this effective management uh, procedure in place. The survivors uh, in your community benefit from the volunteers' help uh, tremendously. It is cost-saving, right? The, the volunteering in this sense through a VRC, we're providing a free service to your communities um, by having these uh, volunteers and resources out there so that any sort of funding they might be receiving, whether it's from federal, state, insurance, whatever it can be, then instead of paying somebody to clean up, you can have a group there to help clean up or help get things ready for a rebuild phase where then they might want to spend that those funds in that area. So it really does help the survivors in your communities, um, as well as your agencies per, be able to get back up and provide some of the services. Your communities can recover quickly or more quickly. Um, it frees up some of the other state and federal resources that are out there um, by having these coordinated volunteer efforts coming in. And finally, to the volunteers who are there and coming through your volunteer reception center may become affiliated then with some of your organizations locally or nationally. And so you also can gain uh, more affiliated volunteers for the next time you're needed. So just a couple of principles here and values of guiding management uh, that guide our, our management of spontaneous volunteers. Um, again, they offer affiliation opportunities. They help identify what are our resources and how do we utilize some of our existing resources. We engage uh, our volunteers in different functions of the emergency management process, and it helps educate people too about the process. So next time they have a, a different understanding of what's going on and sometimes the time it takes to get some of this set up they can help fill in and help form a VRC team um, currently as well as in the future. Uh, you can create effective communication, um, making sure you're talking about this and planning again going forward. So uh, definitely a lot of uh, value in this. So we're not gonna do this activity, but again, as I said, I'm keeping some of this in here uh, so that it's it's a tool you can use in the future as well as um, you know in some of your re, um, recap and, and uh, moving forward with your teams of how you can plan for this um, going forward as well as as you learn in this process. Um, all right. I'm gonna move into a little bit and share some of the elements of a spontaneous volunteer management plan. So we talked a little bit about what are volunteers in times of disaster? What does that look like? Benefits and challenges and how, how do we be aware of that? Now we'll talk about what are elements of a volunteer plan, specifically the spontaneous disaster response volunteers. So the difference here is, uh, or, or something to keep in mind, you have people who are coming to want to volunteer or who are already there or who are calling and emailing and signing up. Uh, and it's a large group of individuals and people. If they show up, it's uncoordinated, as I mentioned. And so we want to make sure we have some things in place so that we can take this large group of individuals move them into a coordinated effort. There's planning involved, there's support, there's resources, so that they turn into a coordinated group of people and not just a massive group of individuals, but that they can work together in smaller groups, in teams, and have an overall coordinated operation and plan. And so that's some of the elements here we're gonna talk about what are the specifics needed to build that plan and to make sure uh, you're talking about what that looks like. I will mention too, in general, uh, from my experience in disaster response, um, 
there's a lot of times you're in the middle of this, even as experienced disaster responders or, or relief effort uh, organizations, every disaster is different. Every community is different. You go into and provide services and support to. And so what you did one time might not and most likely won't work 100% the same way the second time, even if you're in the same community, but definitely between communities. And so what does that mean for you going into this? Uh, you're going to make decisions based on what you know today. You're going to implement those decisions. Some of it's going to work and some of it's not. What's not going to work, you're going to learn the new information and make new decisions and new plans based on that new information, and it's going to work. And then something's going to change, and you're going to have to make some new decisions and, and, and new plans and make adjustments. That is normal, especially in these early days and weeks of disaster response in our communities. After a while, things will become more stable, and you won't have to do that as frequently. But just that that's my experience in a variety of ways, and that's okay to kind of operate that way for a while um, until you get to a more consistent kind of uh, uh, way of, of, of things. All right, so what is a spontaneous volunteer management plan? Um, it's a plan that helps you direct these spontaneous volunteers and their efforts effectively using a VRC uh, uh, volunteer reception center structure and to staff it efficiently to help manage these volunteers during your relief efforts. Um, it should be ultimately something that is written down and documented on paper and that you have this. It's shared out with your uh, VOADs and other partners that are involved in that VRC effort within your county or your community um, and shared with the state for awareness purposes. I understand you are coming here today because we're working to get something set up here in the next few days or sooner. And you may have some of this written down, you may not, and that's okay. As you are going through it, try to take a moment each day to write down what you did. Maybe that is a volunteer role, having someone follow you around as you get a VRC set up and writing things down, um, at least initially especially if you don't have it, have anything. And maybe there is, but you don't know there's something that exists. That's okay too. It will come, come out throughout the process. So, but ultimately this plan is something that documents the strategy, um, establishes what the roles and expectations are in uh, spontaneous volunteer management plans within your communities and counties. It prepares, it can help prepare your community organizations for when an event happens, and it helps prepare the public to be able to serve and volunteer and provide their support. Um, and it can be something that is supported by an overall volunteer and donations plan within a state uh, effort. So what should be included? So there should be an overall purpose, assumption, and policies outlined in this plan. There should be guidance for community organizations, information in there about pre-disaster education strategies. That would be before the event happens. What, what do we push out? What do we tell people? It could be months at a time during when things are calm, you're doing training, you're doing outreach events, you're talking to your VOAD partners and the state partners, but then also the days and weeks leading up to it. Hey, don't, don't self-deploy. If you want to support, this is where to go. Here's our website, that type of stuff. What are the procedures to, act, to activate a VRC and what does that look like? Immediately following the disaster event, what is our public messaging strategies there? Again, where do I sign up? How do I get involved? What is needed? What's not needed? Being clear about that. And then overall VRC operations plan. What does that look like? So again, this may exist for some of you. This may not exist for some of you. And that's okay. These are um, uh, just something to think about. And if it doesn't exist, don't spend the next three weeks creating it. Spend the next few days doing what you need to do to respond, but write things down and then come back to this in a few months and fill in the gaps. Um, this will be a good kind of debrief activity for some of you as well to figure out, OK, how, how can we support this and coordinate this going forward? So the next few slides, I'll mention some of these things, but again, I'm not going to go through every step because I know uh, this is more focused on a just-in-time training, but I, again, want to provide this context here um, for, uh, for us as we move forward in our conversation. So again, that 
what first section is about the purpose of a, of a volunteer spontaneous volunteer management plan that what are the assumptions what are the policies to guide this so you again um, you kind of talk about what is our mission, what are our goals here, we're going to establish a VRC team, we're going to define the criteria for how do we prioritize needs for volunteers, where do we put volunteers, um, what is the physical VRC procedure, do we have a virtual VRC procedure, are there differences there, what do we do for training and prep and preparedness for this, uh, supporting the spontaneous volunteers, and is there any sort of available mutual aid uh, within the state or other partners that would be involved in this. Uh, what is a virtual VRC? Uh, this is something that could be managed um, all through a web-based uh, platform and, and have communications and strategies for it and, and having clear messaging, having a call center, having opportunities, being able to share out and connect volunteers to. Um, I think we are wanting to focus on a physical VRC operation, but again, within your overall spontaneous volunteer management plan, this would be something to talk about with your team and your county and organization to figure out what would this look like or do we do a hybrid approach and things like that. So um, also this can work if we have communications. I know you all uh, were dealing a lot with um, lack of communications for a while as well. So it's something I think just you need to make sure like you have backup plans in place if you do go that route. So another section is around guidance for community organizations. So regardless of the type of disasters that occur, survivors, you know, usually need basic um, things such as water, food, shelter, transportation. So in your planning for for this, what how can you anticipate community needs? There are some basic things communities will need immediately, and then there are other things, depending on your location, you might need more of or different types of, of needs that come up. And it depends what your community is made up of, the age, the uh, locations, um, is there schools, are there businesses, What what is in your community? And so in your planning and figuring out your spontaneous volunteer management plan guide, these are some of the things you um, you would talk about and, and think about what that looks like. The pre-disaster public engagement strategy section, this is something about what you need to prepare the public for, as well as community organizations. But the key point here is helping the public realize to never just show up, right? We don't, we want them to wait until help is needed and we have a way to safely support them and coordinate those volunteers and those individuals that want to come show up. And we want to make sure they're, the people are with the right skills and the right resources are showing up at the right time. So that's all part of that pre-education uh, strategy is, is talking about that and ensuring people know that. Um, some of this We'll go into the post-disaster uh, communication strategies as well, but it's important if they know it ahead of time. The next section is about your activation procedures for a volunteer reception center. So who's responsible for deciding to activate, to set it up, to make the phone calls, to make the communication? You know, who notifies the rest of the team? Um, who notifies the venue you're going to use? Making sure you have agreements in place for different using a venue and a potential backup venue. Um, what do the the resources needed for kind of your initial week of setup? Having that go kit ready for those initial few days. You can replenish later, but you need something to get to get started. What does your initial staffing structure need to look like, and how do you expand that or um, it, you know, retract it depending on the size of the event. So again, this would be part of that uh, plan. Again, post-disaster messaging strategies. Um, again, similar to pre, but you're just focusing in on the specific needs for that event and how do you um, get connected? What are the hours of your VRC? What's the location? How to get involved? How do we connect with other entities that might be on the ground? How? What specific volunteers are you looking for? Specific skill sets? That's all part of that, that post-messaging strategy. So this is relevant for you today, I think, as you get your VRC set up. Um, making sure you have clear communication. Is there a phone number? Is there an email? Is there a location? Is there, where do I park? How do I get, do I need to come 
prepared with my own tools? Will there be tools or, or safety gear provided on site? So again, we'll talk about some of that in a moment, um, but that's this is where you're at, um, especially as you get ready to stand up and activate a VRC uh, in the coming days or weeks. Then you have your VRC operations plan. So this is uh, documenting what the, the, the VRC looks like. Um, what might be your hours or initial hours? How do you figure out uh, when you scale back a VRC or when you grow a VRC? Do you need to add, depending on the layout of your community and where things are located, do you need to add another an additional site or an annex site to it? Is it a, another just checkpoint? Maybe everyone still comes to the main VRC, but you have another smaller one that has additional supplies at it or a, another checkpoint people can go to if that's needed in your community. Uh, the registration for volunteers um, in your VRC, how does that work? Um, how do you, and, and the big thing is documenting, making sure you have a plan to document what type of work is being done. So you need to document every volunteer that comes in, the time they started and the time they ended for that day, the types of work and where they're doing it. So an address of where they're going to and were they mucking and gutting? Were they doing debris removal? Were they doing something else? Were they helping donate uh, donation uh, management at a don donations warehouse? Were they, um, you know, doing doing the uh, inventory of that? Whatever that looks like, just kind of making sure you know the person, the time they started and ended for each day, the date for that day, and the location and type of work they were doing. Those are important things to document. That's typically the, the main things that um, the state needs to be able to turn their documentation in for volunteer hours to FEMA to provide that, that cost match for, uh, for the, the dollars that are coming in. Within your VRC operations plan too, you'll talk about how do we make sure we're providing you know, any sort of safety or training or specific skill training, depending on what your volunteers are going to be doing and making sure we have a way to identify the volunteers you have screened through your VRC. Um, it could be badging. It could be a, a wristband, the, the paper colored ones. It could be um, some other vest that everyone gets going in and then they turn it in when they leave at the end of the day. Um, I've done... Um, uh, um, like putting a piece of duct tape with their name on their jacket or their shirt sweater or whatever for the day. Uh, some sort of way to identify the volunteers is important as well. So that if you get a call from a homeowner um, saying, hey, I have some people here. Uh, I wasn't sure they were coming today. Are they with you? You can try to help them identify well. Who are they? Do, do I have them on my list? Or do I know I sent somebody there or not? As well as, oh, well, do they have this type of identification on? Yep, they we we sent them to you. They're they're you know verified essentially. So those are some things about um the the VRC operations plan to think about. Some additional things within your VRC plan. Uh Depending on the location of your VRC, how do you transport from there to the work sites? Um, are people walking? Are you providing busing and vans? People on their own? Um, what does that look like? Uh, again, maintaining a database of the information that's coming in from uh, volunteer requests, but also the volunteers themselves. Uh, making sure there is some sort of communication um, liaison plan in place to share what's going on, not only with the community, but with the, the other VOAD partners that might be supporting you, as well as your state efforts um, that are going on. Um, having a way to track your volunteers, maybe you have a volunteer recognition opportunity later on to make ensure you're thanking all your volunteers for coming in, and then what is a, a DMOB plan for your VRC? How do you close up? At what point do you do that? Or do you scale back? Or do you change the operations of the current structure um, of the VRC? So, and there are going to be some costs associated with operating this. So you want to document that and figure out that process of, uh, of, of costs. And again, documenting um, that as well is important. 
All right, so these are just a few overall best practices for effective management of spontaneous volunteers in disaster. Um, I have a couple of things here I'm gonna wrap up and then I'll pause for some questions and comments and then we'll transition into volunteer reception center structures and elements of that specifically. So just so you know kind of where I'm at. Um, so first, just some of the best practices here, again, ensuring that there is a plan in place. Um, again, it's one that exists now, or you're going to create it and review it uh, throughout the event. Having, um, uh, knowing who your potential VRC team members are and the partners are going to be for that. Um, I think there's, you know, you're on the phone today or or some of you are on the phone today. Um, so that that's part of that. Um, identifying the other community needs for volunteers, having a way to identify what those needs are. Um, so you you know where you're gonna send your volunteers to and, and plan for that. Having a volunteer operations and logistics plan, ensuring that you have a way to support that as well as the overall kind of logistics of operating uh, a facility, so to speak making sure there's coordination of the different hotlines or technology within the VRC, as well as with your other state and federal partners. Um, make sure you have adequate VRC staffing and know like what your hours are or what your rotation of staff look like for the different stations. Reimbursement uh, for expenses incurred, having a plan in place for that. Um, Pre and post disaster coordination, again, with all those partners. So um, right now we're in it and we're post the event a little bit. And so making sure there is that coordination there is key so that everyone has the right message to share out when they're talking to people about this. As well as um, coordination with any other local uh, providers or referrals if there's two and one or other entities within the local communities where this VRC is operating, ensure they have that uh, information about the, the plan for spontaneous volunteers. Um, understanding what are the roles for these volunteers, right? And knowing when you're here, we're going to assign you to a task based on your availability, your skill set. And sometimes you have to say, thank you. We'll call you when we have an opportunity available. Not everyone that comes through a VRC in that moment may be assigned to a task. And that's okay because you don't want extra people just sitting around, but, uh, and you want to make sure people are going to have a meaningful experience, but can also have a safe experience. And so um, most everyone's, you'll probably be able to find an opportunity for them that day or that moment, but there's going to be some, you may have to say, you know what, I know in the next couple of days, we're going to have this is, I think you would be a great fit for this, uh, volunteer activity. And so, um, let's plan and we'll touch base tomorrow to confirm the time and location of that or, or whatever that may be. And then just making sure there's, uh, understanding the roles with, again, the different partners or government entities or NGOs and things like that within the, the spontaneous volunteer management plan. Within a VRC and the, the work of disaster response, um, a lot of our federal and state partners have a basic incident command structure that they follow. They have specific roles, they have specific units, specific leaders. Um, people who are responsible for different activities. And so it's good to just understand that there, there are these structures that us as VOADs um, and uh, volunteer agencies are playing in that space or trying to support our work. And so we recommend that we also have some sort of general uh, structure in place or incident command structure in place when it comes to a VRC. Um, one, it kind of matches the partners we're working with as well in this space, because somebody's from the state or federal government's going to come when you have a VRC and like, all right, where's your director? I want to talk to them. I have some questions or do you, and, and you can be like, yep, we have that. Or you can be like, you know what? Great. But I think you really want to talk to our community liaison. Um, they're the ones who can make sure they get you the information or, oh, you're asking about, you know, what some of our, um, recent data looks like. I'm going to talk to our data documentation lead um, coordinator. And so it's just kind of good to make sure you match people up that way. Um, it also gives structure to your operation so that you know who's doing what, kind of we know who's on first, what's on second, and how do we best operate efficiently. And so you have a, a VRC would have 
some sort of um, director, a manager of the VRC, or here it's listed as command, um, but, you know, a leader for that operation. Um, and for, it's for that day, you might have three people that can play that role interchangeably, but for the, that day, who is the, the VRC director? Who's the one who is, who's available for making decisions? You have a liaison to your community organizations, as well as state and federal partners. And then there's figuring out our operations director. We have somebody who is looking at logistics, um, looking at planning, um, looking at our data and documentation. And so again, depending on the size of operation, these can be shared sometimes, or you can have multiple people in some of these roles or teams. Again, just kind of depends on the operation and the size and, and what's going on. So. All right, so I'm going to transition here into a moment for now talking about an overview of a volunteer reception center and some of the elements that are involved in that. What are those roles? What can it look like when you actually have it set up in your different stations? So before I do that, though, uh, I just want to pause and kind of like, A, see what questions there are. I know I've been talking for 30, 40 minutes here. So I, I wanna pause, see what questions or comments. Again, you can use the chat, you can raise your virtual hand, we can uh, have you share with the audio or, or address it that way. Um, but these are some things too I want us to think about. What, what do we know today in this moment? Do we know a location of where our volunteer reception center is gonna be? Do we know who is staffing it? Do we have a lead staff or agency partner? Do we have people to fill potential roles? Uh, do we know what those roles are? Again, we'll talk about that. We can talk about that more later um, here in, in our time this morning. Um, but also, when do we want or when will the first day of operation be for the public to engage in our VRC? Do we know that? Um, is that communicated yet? Do we need a plan for what that is? Um, if you're just setting it up and getting it ready today, you don't really probably want to open tomorrow. Maybe you do. Maybe you open at noon type thing, right? Uh, it just depends. Do you have the supplies ready to do that? Um, who and how will this be communicated out to your community and partners? What are the supply needs at this point in time or over the next few days? Um, are there any technology needs we have? Um, or are we ready to go in some of these areas, but we need answers for this. So I will pause. We can talk about any of these points here as well as anything I've covered so far, but I will pause and um, see if anything comes in. Chad, do you want us to answer these questions right now or just ask you questions? Um, both. I want to make sure, you know, this is kind of geared for a just in time. So if you are someone who is ready to, you know, get something set up in the next few days, um, we can talk about that briefly here now, um, just to make sure that we're aware of some of that. Um, but I know some of you are on who are also just learning and, and making plans maybe for your community or county for the next couple of weeks or maybe supporting someone who's starting one up. So I want it to be yeah. cool for you. <laughs> Chad, yeah. can you hear me? I can, yeah. Super. This is Margaret Ashby, and I'm coordinating with Ray Sipes with Lutheran Disaster Relief. And I think our plan is to want to start in Asheville, the VRC, on Friday. And so what I would like to ask, and I put it in the chat with my information, is that those people who are on this Zoom, um, because they heard from Ray or their pastor, would contact me after lunch, and um, we can see about our next steps according to your very uh, helpful information. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm talking with John Chiletta, um as as sort of and and Laura Koff is sort of our agency affiliates. And I think after this meeting, I will have some confirmed information about our location for you Lutherans 
and and a firmer idea on our plans. But is that possible to put to let people have that information? Yeah, I uh, so Mar thanks Margaret for sharing that. I see you got um, your contact information in the chat, so I'd say yep, please reach out to her with that. Um, oh, maybe I put my phone number in wrong. Yeah, if you want to check that. Yeah, eight two eight two two six four nine two eight. So and I'll, I'll go back and retype it, y'all. You don't need to tell me 80 million times I made a boo-boo. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Okay. Uh, John, Jonathan, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead and... Hey, Chad. Um, so I am one of the voluntary agencies out here in Buncombe County, uh, Asheville, supporting uh, their county EOC here. Um, the county EOC is driving this effort to stand up Volunteer Reception Center. Uh, we have identified the uh, local United Way offices uh, as the location that we're going to be using. Um, the uh, lead agency for uh, staffing is, as uh, Margaret mentioned, um, the, the Lutherans. Uh, we are partnering closely with United Way. We've got some uh, additional coordination calls with them um, scheduled for this afternoon. They are currently running... Um, volunteer referrals, uh, essentially a virtual VRC, um, and we'll be operating under a, a hybrid model, at least initially, um, as we get this VRC off the ground. We are hoping to, to uh, soft open on Friday. We are not public message. We are not messaging out on it at this point. Um, We'll be using it more for level setting across various um, volunteer opportunities that the county is currently supporting and, and United Way is currently supporting. Um, and then we will start pushing uh, information on that uh, center out uh, once we get the kinks worked out. We are working on supply through the county um, process. Uh, will potentially be reaching out to um, ITDRC to support tech. We still need to have a conversation about transportation, um, whether we will be offering that to uh, county supported sites um, and still need to have some conversations about how we are plugging into um, United Way's system uh, and general, just in general, how we're tracking but that's kind of where we are right now here in Asheville. Great. Uh, that's very helpful uh, both from both of you. Appreciate that context. Um, there's a couple comments in the chat as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that information. Okay. So, uh, all right, I think that's helpful as I go into the next uh, section here as well, knowing some of that. And um, as I go through some of this, is, so I plan to share some ideas and outlines of what a VRC kind of floor plan may look like or structure. Again, it ebbs and flows depending on your space and, and uh, uh, use of facilities. But as we talk about some of the stations and kind of roles as well, you can think about, you know, I think Margaret and Jonathan about um, who might uh, play some of those roles. You might have some of this identified or kind of, um, you know, who, who on your teams might support some of that as well. Um, so we'll use that as an example a little bit, I think, as we go through this next section. But for others who are on the call or maybe listening to this uh, recording later, you can take this example within your own county and community about how this can, structure can look like as well. So wonderful. Any other questions or comments on things before I um, move forward? Okay. All right, not seeing or hearing anything right now. I will move forward. Again, please um, please add them or ask as we go through this. 
All right. Um, again, the slides can be shared as a follow up to this as well. But I'm going to share just a couple samples of what a VRC structure can look like, specifically a floor plan and uh, maybe suggestions around what you want to look at as you build your model, especially here in um, at this United Way office, too, and you know, knowing what space you have or don't have. So overall, again, a variety of ways can work um, for this. Uh, some of these stations will work for you to support. Some it might be your community uh, partners that are maybe sitting in as a representative. Um, some of these, uh, you might do some training or some kind of supplies and uh, providing some information right there on site. It might be uh, not on site, again, depending on where you're at, it might be at the, the work site that the volunteers are showing up as uh, at after they get through your VRC. Um, and again, some of this may all be in one big kind of community center room or conference room or gym or open area, or you might have a couple different rooms you're using within a facility. But thinking of a overall, you're in one big space, um, it's best if you can have two different ways to, to get in and out. So you have one way that's your main entrance that people enter and one way that is separate from that, that can be an exit. Um, that helps from a security standpoint, as well as flow of traffic, especially during the, when kind of your open times, uh, when it's maybe busier, people are all coming first thing in the morning or maybe a couple times throughout the day. So, um, so it is nice if you have the ability to have one entrance and one exit and not a shared one. Again, it helps with kind of a safety protocol as well, knowing that everyone is going through your procedure. But you have, um, I'll talk about the different sections or stations here in a moment, but just to highlight what we have for um, here, you have your uh, green um, stations here, which would be kind of where your volunteers would go through. This blue seating and section here in the middle is just open seating chairs where people and volunteers can sit and where they're waiting. Um, so they're not crowding the different stations. So there's a spot where they can sit and, um, and wait to go through the process. And then these yellow tables or stations are more of kind of your other staffing sections that you might have at a VRC. Again, some of these can be combined. Some of them can be built out more. It, it all depends on every situation is different. But this is uh, kind of what that flow looks like. And then here's another uh, similar example, um, but just shows that um, they have a couple different seating areas. They have some open seating areas kind of in the overall. This might be like in a hallway of a maybe community center, they come in, there's some seating there, they do their check-in tables. And then once they've done their check-in, they can go in and do um, some additional interview and information gathering of the volunteers. And then they can get their assignments for who they're, where they're gonna volunteer. And then they can go get their supplies and understand their safety uh, um, and additional training if they need to. And then they exit. And then on the side over here is some of those other staff uh, things for maybe phone banking or data entry and other supplies and things like that with, again, additional seating in the middle. So just a couple examples here. Again, it all depends on your space, but I think generally it's good to know you're going to want some tables and chairs, <laughs> basic uh, office tables and chairs, uh, folding tables, folding chairs um, to have accessible. Those are important to have in a, in a VRC uh, supply need. So I'm assuming, you know, this local United Way has at least some of that. They might have a conference room you're using. Um, um, and so hopefully that's easy in and out um, so that you can get folks through safely. All right. So now I'm going to mention and talk about some of the different roles or station and stations that we have um, available and, and what that looks like. So great, uh, there are plenty of chairs and tables uh, within the conference room space, so that's great. Um, so you can be able to move and set those up as you need to. And again, you'll learn 
after a few days, you're like, this works great. Or you know what? We need to change the flow of this, or we need to move this section over here because this is where the bottleneck was. Make those changes. You don't have to be stuck with your design from day one as you're going through your operation. It's going to change. It's going to ebb and flow. And I would say too, as your VRC goes on, um, depending on how long it stays operational, the the needs are going to be different. You're going to get more reoccurring volunteers coming through that you don't need to always like fill out a form every time they come in. You just need to check them in, get their assignment and they go. So maybe there's like eventually a, I'm a returning volunteer here to get my assignment, my supplies. Maybe they have a section, separate section or line they can go to um, as well. So again, things can ebb and flow. All right, when it comes to a VRC manager, um, director, kind of leader of that, some of the things that are part of that role or should be considered within that role are overall manage the setup and operations of the of the operation, as well as how do we, you know, demobilize this operation and how do we, you know, wrap things up. So having somebody um, be able to play that role and understand that also within a manager or director, <clears throat> excuse me, director role. You, they need to help recruit and fill the different positions within the different areas. So they're, again, helping staff the VRC. They're helping assign those roles and making sure there are, um, you know, they're supervising those, those kind of other staff roles and positions. You're monitoring the ongoing operations of the VRC, making sure things are happening, going along smoothly. Things are happening the way they need to happen. You are... Um, Checking, you know, your database or files or things like that periodically, um, just to kind of make sure things are running smoothly. Um, handling any sort of communication or press inquiries, whether you do it or you pass it on to someone else who might be that um, kind of public information officer or PIO role or a communication person. Um, so again, you can play that role as a VRC manager or director, or that can be someone else. But you're you're going to be asked questions. And so um, you want to know the answer to it or who's going to know the answer. Um, you will, this role usually works closely with the other city, county, and other officials within that area that you're providing support to, just to make sure you're sharing what you're doing and you're hearing what needs are there. And are we able to meet them? Are there any gaps within that? And are, if the gaps exist, are we as the VRC able to do that? Or do we need to involve someone else in the community for that or another, you know, VOAD partner? Um, you're also in this role coordinating, again, that site setup for um, processing of volunteers. Again, you're, you're helping coordinate kind of the operation with the different staff roles. And again, being that liaison between your emergency, emergency operations center at the state, any other volunteer reception centers that might be going on, um, other partners that are involved, federal partners, state partners. Um, again, depending on the size and scope, that might be a separate role within your VRC too. So as a manager and director of this, you can say, I want a dedicated agency liaison uh, to, to play that role as well, because I need to focus on the operation of the VRC and I need someone else to focus on this, being on those calls, being on those meetings, uh, making sure we're sharing the information of what's going on and that we have a easy way to communicate uh, what we're hearing and what the questions and needs are. And again, that can ebb and flow as time goes on. So that, that's kind of an overview of the VRC manager or director role. I'm going to talk about some of the stations a little bit more within a VRC. So the first main station we talk about as the registration. That's your first spot of where your volunteers are coming and showing up. And so as it's as the folks playing that role, you want to make sure they're personable, that they're friendly, that they are eager to greet the these people, these volunteers that are coming in, so that um, you they can give clear instructions of what to expect at the VRC and kind of for the plan for the day. Um, again, doesn't mean they know all the answers, but they need to say, great, welcome, I'm glad you're here. You know, I need to make sure you fill out this form first, and then from here, you're going to go over there. Or you're, you know, people are going to come 
just willing to do whatever. And there's going to be people who come wanting to do something very specific, but everyone needs to go through a registration process, no matter what that is. Like I said, if you have returning volunteers, eventually that's going to happen and you might have a separate section or table or station for them to go to uh, because they have come for a few days. They kind of know what the process is. You're probably expecting them at this point. So you have maybe certain assignments lined up so they can go in a different area eventually. But through the registration, you're going to have the volunteer complete a volunteer registration, maybe a waiver release form. You're going to make sure you can explain the process so that they can uh, understand what to come next and also understand they might need to uh, wait a little bit just because they show up doesn't mean they're going to go out in the next five minutes to their work site. It takes a little bit of time to get all of that coordinated. Again, some of these stations can be combined. Some of them can be just left separate, um, but these are the, maybe the functions is another way to think about it of what you want to do um, through the process. So comment in the chat about is the registration process already established? Um, so I know it was mentioned that there is a current kind of um, system maybe within United Way or some other system where people can express interest for kind of uh, volunteering maybe, but I don't know if that would be the same process or through this specific VRC, if you would have an additional form or um, other needs to kind of verify some of that. So I don't know. I can pause and see if somebody has thoughts about that, or I think that's something that you will want to talk about later. Okay. So that'll be something you'll work through later today, the next couple of days on that. So great. Thank you. All right, so once they go through the registration and initial kind of welcome station, there's usually we call an interview station. Again, this could be part of that registration form. Sometimes I see that like one page, one side is, or a top half is like contact information about who the person is. The bottom half might be different check boxes of these are the skills I have or the, you know, specific maybe uh, tools or, or resources I can bring or have access to um, a lot of time, or these are the interests I have. And so, um, and then maybe the backside of the form is, is like a waiver, a liability waiver that the volunteer signs. So that's a lot of times the, the what the a form is that I have seen that is part of that initial intake station. Um, and so then the interview is kind of people looking at that and is anything pulling out of like, oh, this person has specific chainsaw experience and they maybe they are certified in that. They have the, the tools and resources. Okay, I want to make sure that then I'm the interview and maybe matching station where I'm working to find an opportunity for this volunteer. I want to make sure that I, I might talk to this person more specifically, be like, all right, I see you have this is this accurate? Is this just like you've chainsawed before or are you certified? Can you lead other, you know, kind of things like that. Or, um, you know, you're just kind of reviewing that form for completeness. You want to make sure that things are um, adequate, uh, adequately filled out in there. So again, you're just kind of watching for that, looking for that. Um, you also in this station or this part of the, the process, also looking for red flags. Is this a volunteer who is, you're learning, maybe you're talking to them like, oh, you have a lot of access to machinery and tools. Oh, you're a contractor. Okay, I, maybe this isn't the right spot for you. We wanna, again, those going through your VRC are there to provide free services to your community um, that needs it and that you're, you're working to do that. You wanna make sure that you are watching and pulling out people who might be uh, wanting to abuse the system and process. And that's where you flag down your director or manager and be like, hey, I need you to talk to this person. Um, and they might not, the person going through this who's in that situation might not know that's what, you know, they're just maybe in the wrong spot. Um, and they need to be directed to talk to other uh, county or local officials to get connected that way as a, as a contractor. Um, or they might be trying to just get in to the system um, and, and kind of scam the system that way. So again, it's important to be aware of that, uh, that does happen. But 
through the interview, you're looking at this and you're looking for information to match this volunteer or this group of volunteers with a opportunity or placement in the community for a work, uh, work order site. So then that's the next process or phase or station is that matching station. So you're looking at the, the volunteers, the referrals for the volunteers, the information of who is there, what skills do they have? What are they able to do? Are they available all day? Are they available just for half a day? What does that look like? And you're taking, and, and how many? Do I have 50 people today that I can break up? Do I have more than that? Do I have less? Do I have five groups of people that have five people each in it? You know, again, that's part of that interview and that mat that um, intake process is knowing who is there so that you can then look at what are the volunteer need requests coming in from your database or phone banks or, you know, Excel spreadsheets or I like a whiteboard in my VRC. Uh, so if that's not on your list or have access in the in at the United Way, I'd look at if you can get one because it's easy to write down what's going on for the day, maybe your chart and plan and document that. So I'm looking at my whiteboard or my maybe it's a bulletin board I'm putting post-its up on to identify these are the needs and and who I think I might be able to get people out. They're ready to take volunteers. They can take five volunteers. It's probably going to take two hours to three hours to do this task. I have two of those and they're on the same block. Great, I can take this group of six people. They're ready to go. They have the tools and resources. Start here. If you finish in time, go to this house next. So that's what matching is. Based on all the information you have from the volunteers that are in the room that day and the needs that you have outlined for the day, you're trying to match those up. Make sure then they have the the information to go. And before they leave your VRC, you're making sure they know where they're going. You give them any safety instructions. Um, if they need any kind of uh, orientation for a specific job or that community, you can, you can provide that oversight. You always want to thank your volunteers. Um, you always want to tell them what to expect. Make sure that they have their identification. Again, are they doing the the paper wristbands do you have any is it lanyards is it ids is it something else um that they have their identification for the day and that they can go out you also want to make sure that they did sign in that you are tracking their time their hours and make sure they know to uh, sign out at the end of their assigned project um is that coming back physically to sign out or is that calling or emailing your VRC to say, hey, we're done for the day. The five of us are done. We're heading out. Again, that might depend on your transportation. If you're taking people to a site and bringing them back, then you're going to be able to do that. Maybe you do that on the bus on the way back or when they come back, they can just go through, drop off the tools or any stuff they had and sign out um, or track that. Again, that's important in times of disaster with a VRC. That's a big role VRCs play is tracking volunteer hours and activities. But you're doing all of this before they leave your VRC. You're making sure they're gonna be safe. They have the tools and information um, needed to be able to do that. The, uh, there's one other thing I was gonna mention here and I just forgot it. It'll come back to me. So those are the main stations that a volunteer or phases a volunteer will go through in a VRC. So you can see maybe how some of them can be combined or you keep them all separate. It just kind of, again, depends on your space, your staffing, what information you know or don't know, things like that. Oh, one other thing, that's what I was going to say. As I mentioned, some volunteers are from your community or surrounding community, so they know what's going on. You're also probably going to get volunteers from outside of your community, right, that want to help and that are showing up through at your VRC. And so some of the safety and orientation stuff is, is important to have for, like, map. Not everyone knows every neighborhood in a community or every street. So I think it's, you know, we all have a device we can use, but it doesn't always work right or it might tell me where to go, but I need to tell them this is what this maybe looks like. And so um, 
having printed out maps of your neighborhoods or where you might be sending people or even again on a big bulletin board, you can be like, here's the X where we're at the BRC and you're going over here. And so this is kind of how you're going to get there. So um, just kind of knowing some of that, maybe having some of those visuals available are important as well in that safety and orientation section before you had sent people out. <clears throat> All right, so other functions or elements of a VRC and some of the roles that you, you will fill or want to fill, this can be filled with your uh, organizations, staff and volunteers. There also are people that are going to come through the VRC that could be great people to fill some of these roles. It doesn't all have to be staffed by your VOAD partner or lead agency. They could be filled by volunteers as well, depending on what's going on, especially if they're like, hey, I'm available for the next two weeks. Um, and I have, you know, maybe they want to be more in like a desk set, set as well, instead of out uh, in the field doing hands-on work. Um, so they could be a great data entry person. They could be a great phone bank person. They could be a great um, kind of runner within your facility to make sure you know, are there any gaps that need to be filled or supplies need to be refilled, things like that. So uh, that's what some of these next slides are going to talk about. Some of those other roles or other functions of a VRC that you may have or may want to um, have uh, sections for or volunteers for. Overall, debriefing is important. Uh, I think we don't always give a lot of time to how we debrief and be aware of, of signs for burnout, um, uh, signs of stress. And so this is important for you who are staffing the VRC to be aware of it for each other and check in with each other and have opportunities. I, if you can, I always suggest in these days to do a daily debrief. If that's not feasible, do it frequently enough that it's not when did we last kind of debrief what's going on? Um, I think especially though debriefing not only the operation of your VRC, but just the environment you're in. Um, but it's also important to have that opportunity or give that opportunity to your volunteers. when If they are coming back to check out or if they're calling to check out, it, I think it's great to say, awesome, how did it go? Is there anything that we should be aware of for tomorrow? Um, how is your team doing? Were you safe? Were you okay? Maybe there's a few questions you want to ask everyone at the end of their volunteer shift as well, um, just to have that informal slash formal check-in. And it's almost a debrief opportunity just to be aware of what's going on. Another section is around a phone bank, or this is, uh, it could be a web-based process that people are calling in or emailing in to either request volunteers or those who want to volunteer. Are they the same number? Are they the same email line? Do you have separate ones? Uh, a lot of times, again, you all can talk through this as you get ready to set things up. Sometimes in my experience, I... Um, We'll, we'll just start a uh, um, a new Google account uh, for this XYZ VRC uh, operation or whatever, you know, at gmail.com. And I create that. And then we have a shared database that we can create Google Forms in. We can create spreadsheets. We can create shared documents in. We have a shared email that we can put out and we have access to for this VRC. And it can kind of, it's not tied to just me, Chad Driscoll. It's tied to a general one. And maybe three or four of us have access to it, right? Or more people, depending on what that looks like. And if I'm not there that day, someone else is able to check it and manage that process. A lot of times you can do a Google phone number, I think, through that process. So there's benefits through that. Again, you might have a system to be able to handle that um, um, through your organization or other partners, but kind of knowing what that looks like. And that can support a phone bank or a data entry coordination um, information side of things. So this is something here um, to think about in a role you might want to staff for, uh, especially in those early days or week of starting your operation of a VRC, because you'll get a lot of inquiries. So you want a way to have somebody who can manage that or different people who can support that. From a technology standpoint too, 
you can set up, you know, that you, for example, if you set up a, a Google Drive um, for this VRC, you can go to then ITDRC and say, we need five computers, we need some phone numbers or some phones. Here's, they can also give you a phone number assigned to that, or you can say, this is the phone number I want assigned to this device. Um, so ITDRC is a great resource. I've used them a lot. Um, they're, I know, probably being utilized in your community already, so they'll be ready to set up. They can set up something within 24 hours usually or less. Um, they're great people. So they have a lot of different uh, opportunities. They can set up your Wi-Fi network or a, hot, or a wired or whatever that looks like. Um, whatever your need, needs may be from a technology perspective, they most likely have it and will be able to get that set up. So that supports phone banking and the data entry coordination work that you do. So again, this is one of those maybe back office roles, right? That you have volunteers. If you're doing paper forms, and a lot of people do that, especially as you're starting out, uh, for volunteers coming in who are signing up, you you wanna keep that because that's the kind of original paper, but it would be nice to transition that into probably a, um, digital format. So you then might have somebody who's taking, all right, from the last hour, here's my volunteer forms. I'm going to type in their name, their email, you know, at least some of the basic information about who this person is. So I have a snapshot of who's coming in. How many unique individuals do I have or, you know, have come through our VRC? Um, it's not necessarily the sign in, sign out, um, for the day, you might add that in later, or that's a separate data entry thing of keeping a daily tab of the number of volunteers, the referrals, the volunteer hours, um, As, but I also want to keep a general log of all of our unique volunteers. So that's a, that's a role there about this. And then runners in a VRC, this is um, sometimes you you might not be able to leave the station you're assigned in. Maybe I am that registration, that first station, and I'm welcoming people. I'm getting the form sign. I realize, oh, shoot, I have three forms left. <laughs> I need more. I, I need to fly. But if I leave, that may mean people are going to follow me and forget to sign in if it's going to take me five minutes to get that or whatever, you know. So you want to flag down a runner who can come get you and refill your supplies there. Um. Uh, this also could be a role that can help fill in uh, if somebody needs a break. They can jump into that role for 10 minutes if somebody needs to step out or somebody's going to go grab lunch or whatever that looks like. Um, a runner can, can fill in that. Um, they can help just communicate and be like, hey, I have two groups of people of 10 that are here to check in. Can you go talk and prepare you know, those who are matching volunteers with, I'm going to work to get their information, but can you go tell them, hey, we have two groups, large groups, uh, and get them ready to maybe find an opportunity for these groups. So that runner can go do that while you start the intake process for this group of volunteers. Um, so those are some things. Again, this could be combined with someone else's role or you have a specific role. This is great for a vol single volunteer who's coming in who might Either they don't care what they do, or they might want to just say, hey, I'm available all day today. Is there something I can do here to support this operation? This could be a role they could play as well. So those are some of the roles or stations or functions within a VRC. Um, and the reasons why we may, why we have those. I think overall, we have this structure in place to provide a safe environment for our volunteers, for you as uh, staff or, or organizations trying to coordinate these spontaneous volunteers. Um, and it's a way just to create some, hopefully, some calmness in the community that might not be feeling that calm. Having an organized structure and having that be experienced by these volunteers or groups that are going to go out to volunteer and provide time and effort in your community that is dealing with a lot sets them up to be more successful than if they come in and it's more frantic or it's like, wait, I go here and then I have to cross across the room to get that. And then I come back here to exit and get my tool. Like having a, a good flow also sets them up to be calm and successful when they're volunteering. 
So when it comes to VRC activation and operations, again, you have a decision to activate, you're gonna notify your VRC team and understand your procedures of how you then communicate that out and identify those community needs uh, and community volunteers. Sounds like you have some of that in place and you'll be uh, completing some of that in the next day or so. Um, and then ensuring overall, there's a way just to be aware of this can be a stressful situation. How do we check in with people? How do we make sure we're being healthy, we're being safe? Um, we're taking breaks when we need to, it's important to do that. And uh, we ask for help when we need it. And then eventually you'll be talking about demobilization of a VRC operations and what happens next in that transition. All right. So we talked about the spontaneous volunteer management plan and the VRC operations plan. Now you're in the point of where you're implementing all of that through a VRC operation. Um, I have a couple more slides to cover as well as we um, wrap up. I'm gonna pause again for any additional questions, comments, uh, thoughts that, that folks have. Hey, Chad, could you just quickly run through, you don't have to do the descriptions, but just list out the key roles um, that you went over and kind of gave in detail? Because I think I missed one or two in my notes. Sure. Um, I might go to this. This kind of showed them. So you have, so you have your overall, I guess there's a couple of things. You have your... Um, maybe leadership team of your VRC. You have a director or manager of your VRC. You have a, you you want to probably have at least, probably at least two other people that are helping with the, the management of it. You you have your, your main person and then you have somebody who can help with maybe a liaison or communication support. And then somebody who can help with kind of day-to-day -day logistics. What are our supply needs? How do we plan for what's happening today and what's happening tomorrow. So maybe those three, and then you could add more, um, but kind of thinking of it that way. And then from there, you have the different roles or stations within a VRC. So you have your reception, your, your welcome area. Then you have an interview station. This is completing that form or reviewing the form or the skills of the volunteers. That's the purpose of that is just, is there anything specific a volunteer has that we need to highlight or are they here just to provide their, their labor, their hard work, which is great. And then we have a matching station. So how do we match up these volunteers to the needs that are, uh, homeowners need or community members need, the survivors need. And once they've done that and you've matched them up, they know where they're going, you're going to make sure then before they leave, you do a review of safety procedures, orientation about what's going on. Um, do they know where they're going? Do they know their plan for the day? Do they have the right tools? Things like that. And then they exit. So that's kind of the main things from a, a volunteer we'll go through. And then um, kind of the other roles that are needed probably, or that you may play would be um, data entry, phone banks, supplies, runners, things like that. Um, and there's just a, a chat in the, in the um, chat box too with some of that. Thank you, that was great. Of course. Yeah, fact sheets, things like that are very helpful for not only you to have, but to have available for your volunteers um, and to be aware of that. So yeah, go ahead, uh, John, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. We had, we had discussed um, encouraging carpooling from the VRC out to uh, individual sites as a way to mitigate the need for transportation and just generally to keep fewer vehicles out of those parking lots. Um, is there a associated liability risk with that? Is there is that a um, is there a concern there? Um, I guess how I would answer that is 
uh, I'm assuming the the parking lot at the United Way is probably, you know, there's enough space there or around there for people to park. There's probably, it's probably public parking to begin with. So from that standpoint, I think you could just tell people or have a sign up to, at least for people who are leaving vehicles there, hey, we're, you know, we're not responsible for or, you know, et cetera, or whatever, if you want to cover it that way. Um, and then for people carpooling, I think, are they comfortable? Some will, and some will be like, you know, I, or I don't have room or whatever. So, but if you want to know that, uh, who had, like, maybe you add that question to your intake form and be mm -hmm. like, do you have, uh, are you comfortable carpooling with other volunteers or something? You could also include it there just so you have that. Um, but I think, I, there, there'd be limited probably issues. I've seen that happen. People be like, yeah, just hop in. You know, people who are volunteering know they're probably going to be with other people and it's a group activity. That's part of the benefits of, all, of just general volunteering too, right? Is we're engaging with other people, we're making connections or we're just, you know, learning and, and meeting new people. So um, I don't know if that directly answered your question, but that's kind of would be some of my thoughts around that. And I would say I have seen that before. Um, and I think it's important to remind people, you know, if we have six of you going out, there's, and you're all, and there's five groups of six people, you might all be in the same three block area. That's a lot of vehicles to have to be in the same area that's already has stuff around it that might not be able to be parked at. So um, maybe it's just, just helping educate them of why you're asking them to carpool as well. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Chad, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Great. Uh, this is Steve. Uh, I may have missed this, the answer to this question when I ran to fill my coffee cup, but uh, will the uh, slides of this excellent PowerPoint be available for download or printing or something for us to go fall back on? Um, yes, I've provided it to Volunteer NC, and so um, I think the record it's being recorded as well. So I think, I don't know, Kenny, if you have a plan of how you might share this out or where people will be able to find this after today yet, or if you're going to email it or post it, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, more than likely we'll download whoever, um, of course, you register for the for the, the training. So basically we get those emails and probably send it, to, send it to you guys through a link that you'll be able to download. But the presentation also will be posted on our Volunteer NC YouTube webpage too um, once it's over as well. Great. Thank you. And for our Lutheran volunteers at the uh, Asheville BRC, I'll push out uh, some associated materials and fact sheets uh, as well. Great, thanks. Other questions or comments at this point before I move to to wrap some things up? Hey, Chad, this is Laura Croft, also helping in the EOC with this project. Yeah. And I think um, our next plans are to talk with our local partners, with our United Way, Margaret, with the, the Lucian folks, and John here to see what today's next steps are. Yeah, but this has been great info. Thank you. Good. Great. Good. So uh, I'm just looking... All right, so we're transitioning into implementing this. So this is kind of what you're doing now, <laughs> kind of figuring out your communication strategies, uh, getting this stuff in place, figuring out what other partners are involved, what other kind of aid might be needed in, in your work to implement this. Um, I think it's important just to know how you manage safety and risk, which we've talked about a little bit um, of knowing that and making sure there is a, a screening process in place and, and any potential training, and then that you have a plan for that information management, that you're tracking the, the skills and the, the needs 
the volunteer hours and there's that overall just coordination to with any other uh, groups that might be on the ground. As you think about this too and start standing this up, this might be something that whether you think about it now or in another week, what are those other partners that can help you be successful in, uh, in this operation? I think especially as we move further away from the actual event when it hit your community, the waves of volunteers or the groups of volunteers will slow down a little bit. So this is where sometimes you might, how do we engage other partners in the need for volunteers is going to still exist. So how do we maybe help coordinate other groups, other entities to share our message, but also help us be uh, volunteers out in the field. So this is something uh, you can reference later as well in your planning and kind of coordination of that, like who from our nonprofit community or within our region or within our network could be beneficial here. Who within our government agencies can provide some other additional support or communication here? And from our business community, how can they be supportive of this VRC operation? And so um, this is something, again, as your VRC team and leadership, you can discuss this and, and planning and, and what that may look like. Um, and then this would be, again, like an activity we do if we're doing this ahead of time, but um, uh, but just kind of thinking about who are those partners and the roles they can play. So again, you can think about that as you begin to stand this up. Um, and this might be some, some helpful conversation pieces if you need that as well. The last thing I want to do is just briefly touch on and reference this, but again, this will be helpful for later um, in your operations is how you transition to recovery and how VRCs are, can be supportive of that. So again, I'm just gonna highlight a couple things on these slides and then I'll wrap up with any additional comments or questions that you all have or wanna, wanna mention. So, the transition to that long-term recovery um, planning and support and, and needs that you and your communities are going to have, that a VRC can really be a springboard for that. Um, they, through VRC, you're encouraging volunteers to, to volunteer, but also you may get those volunteers to affiliate with some of these organizations, which may be around in that long-term recovery phase. If you have volunteer teams that have come through or signed up, but maybe you didn't use them initially, you could reach back out to them to provide support in the long-term recovery phase and, and uh, efforts. There will be additional volunteer opportunities and volunteer blitzes and days and uh, you know efforts that are going to be needed in the months uh, and years ahead. And so again, the data from a VRC can help communicate that out. Um, you can transition to providing some of this, again, back to maybe that virtual support system and what does that look like. Um, and so definitely uh, this what you're doing now through the VRC is beneficial down the road for this county and this community as well. Documentation, recognition. So there's often um, this window where we're leveraging these, uh, you know, large groups of volunteers immediately after this. And so um, we want to make sure that we're capturing everything now, but we also want to ensure that we're encouraging people to continue volunteering, continue, did they have a great experience? We wanna capture their stories too. We want to retain them as just volunteers in general in our communities. And that might mean specifically with a specific organization that you have, but also just might mean in general, we want to make sure people have good volunteer experiences so that they just continue to want to give back and support whatever the need is at that particular time. And so um, recognizing them, uh, supporting uh, other entities with data too, if there's further grant opportunities down the line for long-term recovery groups or plans, um, data and, and information from the VRC can help support that uh, sometimes. So just kind of, again, keeping that um, 
in mind is, is helpful for the long-term recovery piece. Um, by doing, again, your work now through the VRC, uh, getting volunteers out to help that immediate need and what's going on can later on help um, the, the work of your long-term recovery groups as that's happening as your community is transitioning back to uh, that new normal of things. Um, they're helping to resolve and take away some of the immediate risk by providing that support and that cleanup now so that later on they can focus on other uh, recovery needs within that community. And then as you think about wrapping up, demobilizing the VRC and transitioning more to that long-term support role um, and not the immediate response recovery efforts is what, what do we do then with that documentation? How do we own that? Uh, how do we tell the story of what our VRC did? How do we also make sure we uh, evaluate the plan and restock our stuff for the next time? So you have your, maybe you need to go through your bins of supplies. How do we doc inventory that? How do we also then just tangibly get ready for the next time you want to, want to, um, um, go through that go kit and other things. And so definitely um, a lot of different elements here in how we demobilize a VRC um, and, and different areas that we want to look at, but that's also part of that transition as well. So engagement of spontaneous volunteers and long-term recovery efforts. So there's going to be these moments, these anniversary moments that the media is going to bring up your elected or local officials, other businesses, and they're going to want to do projects or maybe raise awareness or talk about ongoing efforts that still have needs. And so having this data, having this information can help support that if, if that is important to you all as well. Um, it can help support the long-term recovery groups that are going on as well and supporting them for these volunteer days, six months to in a, or a year out or five years out, whatever that may look like in your community, there's going to be these opportunities to engage again. So just kind of, again, effective spontaneous volunteer management uh, in times of disaster like this helps in all aspects, not only before, during, and immediately after, but long-term after as well. It helps set your communities up for more success. So. so those are just a couple of the kind of transition things as well. Wanted to mention that. Hey, Jay, you got a few um, questions in the chat. I think the first one's from Scott. So... Uh, background check process for volunteers. It varies, uh, honestly. I don't know if there's been conversations yet about the full intake process and kind of what that looks like um, for for this county, but um, it, it varies. Um, sometimes there is a process to do a full background check. Sometimes it's um, a... Um, we're doing it through a supervised volunteer group. So we're also limiting or not putting individuals in spaces alone with our survivors. So there's a kind of that checks and balances there as well as where we have a, a form they're filling out and liability. So, but I don't know if others wanna to speak to that right now or that could be part of the planning. Yeah. So. Um... We're our current opportunities are all pretty low risk. We won't be doing full background checks for volunteers coming through the center um, for volunteers at the center. I'm not sure what um, Lutheran disaster responses or reliefs, um, you know, process is, but they're a trusted partner. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen a variety of things, but I think generally for the volunteers coming in, it is 
a low risk opportunity. And that's part of why we have the structure in place of a VRC and why we want everyone to go through essentially all those stations because it is a way to fully screen someone too. And that is a role of the staff as they're watching for potential warning or red flags or warning signs. And so you're kind of looking like, is someone really anxious to get into to an assignment? That may happen. I didn't really talk much about that, but that may happen where you get somebody who's just like, why do I have to fill this out? Asking and questioning every step of the process. That can be a red flag for a variety of things. Are they a survivor and are they under stress? Are they someone who is just also, are they someone who is wanting to skirt the system and get in as to, to get, make money off of this? Are they, is there some other reason? And so you need to watch for that and pull those people off to the side and have a conversation and just kind of assess what, what is going on. So, um, but generally, you know, you're in a low risk and you're volunteering in a group opportunity and not individual one-on-one -on -one with survivors. And so I think, again, you want to probably make that as a guiding principle for your VRC operation. Like we're not going to put an individual in with a survivor individually. Our goal is everyone's going to be in groups of two or greater. Um, and for larger groups, we'll probably have one of our maybe volunteer leads on site with them and checking in. So things to think about, but that it is safety is important in that. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I see a couple of questions about the value um, of volunteer rates. So uh, yeah, that's something that um, FEMA and the state will work through once you have your volunteer hours and they'll work on, on um, calculating that. Other questions, other discussion, other items for clarity. Um, we have a little bit of time left in our scheduled time here. So I wanna make sure um, you feel okay with your next steps, um, but I'm also happy to give you back a little time so you can talk about that as well um, before we wrap up. Hey, Chad, quick question. Um, I am uh, in the process of assembling all of our Paperwork seems like um, a couple of the different guides I'm looking at have uh, different um, sort of versions of templates and and whatnot. Do you have a good like single PDF document of all of the VRC forms? Does that exist in one place, or do I just need to cobble it together and copy and paste Buncombe County? Um. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Jonathan, um, this is Erica Goffin with United Way of Asheville and Buncombe County. Mm -hmm. and we actually have a lot of this kind of stuff already in place. So I am hesitant to, I know that we need to do all the paperwork, but I'm wondering if you and I want to touch base, like after we have a little bit larger discussion, mm -hmm. so that if something's already created that could be utilized, that's simple, that we can do that. Um, well, for that. And so, yeah, I just don't want anybody, any of us um, duplicating any efforts that may have already been created or we can adapt things to. Mm -hmm. um, but I will need to know more just kind of about this. So if there is a PDF for us to look look at, that would be great. Um, and if y'all could share that with me as well. Okay, I will. Um, I, I think short answer is probably yes. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure I'm not giving you too much either. So um, I can follow up uh, with the state folks and get something to you as another example. But yes, look at what already might be available. Uh, if you think it will meet your needs, I would just use that. Uh, th I, I will also share, I don't think there's like a standard form everyone uses in a VRC. There are these elements, though, that people look for in their forms. And so um, I think from a volunteer intake form, big things are who the person in their communication and kind of who they are capturing. Are there any skill sets they have or things that they want to do? And then a general liability waiver, kind of the main things. And then from there it's probably going to be specific of anything else you have or want to capture or be aware of in your um, local community or organization. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Eric, are you going to be on our uh, one o'clock with Dan? You betcha. Alrighty. You betcha. I'm stuck Sounds at good. the EOC from one until forever. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thanks, Jed. Yeah, of course. 
I saw a comment or a question here about any common mistakes that we can avoid. Um, I would say from my experience, experience is uh, um, going into it without a plan. <laughs> so uh, you are trying to put a plan together. So that's good. You have some people dedicated to helping coordinate and lead this, which is great. Um, I would just make sure that you're on the same page from like a communication standpoint. When are you going to accept volunteers through there? So if you're really, you know, if it's not like publicly open yet, don't put anything out and don't promise things that you can't do <laughs> or you can't guarantee that you can do. Um, and what I mean by that, you, you're going to have, once you open up and, and put this information out there, you're going to get volunteers. You're also going to get the survivors and homeowners reaching out, even if there's another platform or space they're supposed to reach out to. Um, so make sure you know how to redirect people. Um, uh, stay, I'd say, stay within your lane of your role or operation while still being helpful, right? We want to be helpful and, and not discourage people from either asking for help or wanting to provide help. Um, but also, you know, know, know what your area is. Um, a lot of times you are redirecting people. You sometimes become an information center for people as well. And so, cause they see people gathering and they think, great, they have this resource or they have this answer and you might, but also a lot of times you won't. Um, so that's why it's important to have those community have somebody in, in the community at those VOAD meetings, the state and federal meetings, and just on the communication so you can answer questions because you will become uh, also kind of like an information hub. And so um, definitely uh, being being aware of that. And I think, yeah, um, being located at the United Way probably has a lot of that. So there's going to be a lot of shared information and knowledge there, which is great. Um, so that's that's really good. Um, um there, there's probably other things <laughs> uh, to avoid or that I've learned along the way, but uh, I think the other thing is just being flexible and be patient. Um, you're going to set up something and within a few days you might change um, change that process as well. And that's okay because you're being reactive to what the situation is and you're still in a situation where it is adjusting and changing periodically. Um, you know, so it, that's okay. Um, and it's okay to say no. Or if you don't like saying no, say, you know what, that not right now, I'll have to get back to you, um, to whatever you need to do that. It's okay to say that even though you're there and you want to be helpful, you can't do everything. And so, um, it's okay to, to do that. And if you're one who can't say that, you'd be like, you know, let me get you over to this person, <laughs> um, who can provide that response. So, um, those are some other thoughts. So it sounds like we should designate someone at the location who's the no sayer. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> All right. What's the so next? I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Laura. I, I was just going to address that next step piece. So there's a couple of different um, organizations trying to like work together. So Margaret has already posted there. So we're, we are um, really leaning on Lutheran Disaster Relief to supply the people at the stations and kind of that oversight on a day-to-day -day, uh, kind of basis of like, here's what's going on with all our folks. And then we are partnering with United Way for the space and possibly some of that intake piece or that um, documentation piece. That's the piece that we're speaking with them this afternoon about. And then the county is going to be providing those opportunity pieces. Where do we need the volunteers? And we've already got a list rolling of, of where we would like to point folks to. So practically speaking, the next steps are if you're with Disaster Relief, make sure you get with Margaret um, if you're with United Way, make sure you get with Erica and the county folks will get with John and the county about uh, kind of what we're doing. Um, I will say again, our target is for Friday for an informal or a soft open to get this rolling, kind of see how it works. And um, I, I really 
I really, I really think it's doable. I don't know if everybody else on the team thinks so, but I think it's totally doable. Um, so that's kind of where we're, where we're at. I would expect that you'll hear something from Margaret if you're with Lu Lutheran Disaster Relief about how she wants to schedule out folks and where you're going to be at. And um, United Way folks will hear from Eric about what your next steps are. Uh, any clarification on that piece, folks? Um, I have I have a question, um, Chad. When when our church people go back to church on Sunday, um, we can accept volunteers for staffing, even though they have not sat through this particular training session. Correct. So that I, what I provided here was, you know, giving you all an overview of it. And I think it's important for you as like leaders of this operation to understand it. You're going to when people come in and especially if they're going to fill some of those stations, you're yeah. going to want to make sure you're giving them like at least an orientation to that station. Um you can decide if you want to do a general overview for some of your volunteers too about maybe not this full length, but maybe you give a general like, here's our 10 minute overview of things, but uh, you can decide what that looks like for your operation. So, so, so it would be okay for me now to say to all these lovely Lutherans who've sat through this and learned all these wonderful things that an enthusiastic announcement Sunday during announcement time at worship service and my contact information is fully appropriate? So I will, I, I mean, yes. Okay, I, I see really, Laura says, yes, yeah, please. Because yeah, I know I, that we don't have enough to staff the, the vision with those of you who've been kind enough to give your time for this. So mm -hmm. make announcements, y'all. Be enthusiastic. This is a great way to help. And you don't have to expose yourself to toxic mud, uh, heavy logs, and or... I don't know, whatever else it is that's not good for you. So I would appreciate sharing the enthusiasm for ways to continue to help in our community. Thanks. Well, yeah, definitely. I would just have a process to collect to that and figure out what shifts because you'll get great. I can be this day for these two hours or whatever. You no, know, no, no, they can't do that. They have to so, talk to me and then I'll tell them. <laughs> okay. So just as long as you have a way to manage that. And yeah. a potential schedule you're looking to fill out, then you can respond, you know, adequately and quickly for that. But yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Great comments and discussion and questions. Anything else right now? All right. Well, thanks for your time today um, for for listening, going through this and providing some context and information. Um, good luck. Uh, it sounds like you have a great team, at least uh, uh, here in, in this county, um, getting ready to stand up for others who might be on listening or who are listening to this later. Um, trying to do this in your own community or county. Uh, I think you had some great ideas. Make Make sure you also reach out and share any um, support needs or any questions you have with your state folks as well. They can be there to be a connector if needed um, and uh, definitely stay in touch with them so that they're aware of what's happening in the different counties and communities as well in, in this response effort. So thank you all for your volunteer time and your support and organization support um, and good luck. Thanks, Jed.